Okay, it's recording. Hello and welcome to the first session of uh, the new center uh, seminar, Philosophical uh, Topology and Planetary Politics, um, made by uh, uh, Lukash uh, Likav, uh, uh, Likavchan. Uh, the course is designed as an interdisciplinary uh, endeavor uh, spanning environmental philosophy, philosophy of science and uh, technology, geopolitical theory and visual cultures. Its main premise departs from an idea that uh, genders of thinking that concern social, political and ecological realities can be studied uh, in a unified manner via technique uh, of philosophical uh, topology understood as a toolbox for ideation and examination of figures, spaces and tropes implicit in, in given genre of thinking. Philosophical topology is paired in the course uh, with the concept of uh, diagrammatic thinking inspired by uh, Gilles uh, uh, the tools uh, allow to study an application of philosophical topology in comparative, in comparative planetology, which develops a series of geopolitical propositions for the situation of the post Anthropocene, conditioned by the emerging discourse uh, on the concept of the planetary and on the ongoing uh, discussion about geoengineering. The course culminates in the reading of the uh, present geopolitical situ situation with, uh, with respect to climate crisis from the standpoint of the ecological thinking. This is the social, political, and scientific, uh, technological, and uh, as the continuum uh, of the ecological. And um, technology, ecology, and visual cultures. It teaches at a Center for Audiovisual uh, Studies uh, in Prague, at Strelka Institute for Media, Architecture, and Design in Moscow. Uh, Likov Chan uh, is also a collaborator uh, of the Digital Earth Fellowship Program, uh, a member of An author of the introduction uh, for contemporary uh, pl uh, planetology. Uh, and so, uh, yes, look at uh, over to you. Uh, I hope, uh, thank you for your patience with, uh, with my weird uh, Zoom today. <laughs> No worries. Thank you, Sasha. I mean, I'm really happy that I have a partner that can help me to organize things, that can help me with all these. Uh, because I mean, actually, you're a super large crowd here. There's, I see 25 of you, of you but actually there is 34 people in the world. And actually, even at uh, institutions such as Trelka, usually the class is not that big. So it's really quite an experience for me to teach, especially online such a large, uh, such a large, uh, uh, such a large crowd, such a large class of people. So thank you, Sasha, for your work as a moderator. And I'm really looking forward to this endeavor together. So uh, Sasha introduced me partly. She said a couple of words about where I'm based, uh, where I teach. But I mean, I guess the best way how to introduce the whole seminar is to introduce myself a bit more in terms of um, my background, which is philosophy. Uh, I studied philosophy, did my BA and MA in philosophy, now finishing my PhD at Masaryk University in Brno, which is a city in Czech Republic, quite a, a small university town, but quite nice. I'm, I'm there actually. I did all, all of my studies actually there. And so now I'm based in Prague, where I also teach at uh, the Center for Audiovisual Studies at the film school, which is called FAMU. But if you wonder, I mean, some of my colleagues are, for example, Yusi Parika, who's a visiting professor there at the moment, um, working on a project on operational images. And yeah, uh, that's also that also positions me somehow in between uh, uh, visual cultures, uh, philosophy, especially philosophy of technology and political ecology, and some couple of other, um, you know, uh, uh, areas of focus, especially related to geopolitics, which is also going to be partly the topic of our conversation today. And given the fact that uh, you're a, such a large crowd, I was hesitating whether to do this usual like round of presenting yourself, like to, for example, just speaking up, telling me where you come from, what are your expectations. I would still love to do that because I think it sets a good tone for the world for the whole conversation. So even if it may take like 20 minutes or 30 minutes to get introduced all of you, let's simply do that and let's try to perhaps be a bit brief. I mean, I, I also try to be kind of brief when it comes to my introduction 
And so, uh, yeah, I would love to hear just uh, where do you come from? What's your background and what is your expectation for, uh, for this uh, four part seminar about philosophical topology and planetary politics? And I guess I leave it open for whoever wants to start first or uh, who feels up to speaking up now. <laughs> Maybe you, Sasha, you can also introduce yourself yeah. a bit more. Yeah, uh, yeah I can uh, do a bit of an introduction. So I'm currently based in Moscow. And uh, so my main background is in uh, visual cultures. And I am uh, I was supposed to be in uh, Bochum doing my PhD at Ruhr University, Uni Ruhr University in, at the Media Studies Department. And so I'm mm, mainly interested in, uh, I suppose, my theoretical framework comes from critical infrastructure studies. Uh, and I'm also part of a um, research the shared collective uh, distributed cognition cooperative with Anna Engelhardt. Uh, so it's pretty much what I'm doing. So basically, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Sasha. Thanks so much. I see Heidi Nikolaisa next to Sasha. Maybe you would like to continue? We can do that. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Heidi, and I uh, I am uh, based in Aarhus, Denmark. Um, I am a visual artist, and um, I've been kind of uh, following the discourse around these uh, topics for a while. Just uh, um, but I haven't really engaged with it so um, until now. So I'm kind of uh, excited to see where it goes. And this whole format of uh, webinars is also quite new to me. So. Um, there's some adjusting to that, I guess. Um, yeah, I'm working on a couple of projects right now that I see could kind of um, be thought uh, in connection to this. So, yeah. It's good we have artists here. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, Carl Olson is the next one. Uh, hi, Carl. Hi. How are you? Uh, I'm, uh, yeah, my, my name is Carl. I'm um, a, something of a, a, I suppose, a philosopher of geography is what I'm pretending to be. And uh, I'm uh, based in, uh, well, currently I'm doing the terraforming at Strelka Institute. And I'm also in uh, doing my PhD at Newcastle University in, in the UK, but I'm physically, I'm in, I'm in Sweden at the moment. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, I haven't really had, got any set expectations, but I, I'm, I know this will be quite interesting. Yes, I mean, I, I, I read a bit about your practice that you do something like a philosophy of geography. So I, I feel a kind of affinity to that. And I also feel that I'm pretending to be a philosopher, not that much really doing that. Yeah, or, aren't we all? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Eduardo Vinuesa. Hi, Eduardo. Hi, Lucas. How are you doing? Um, well, I'm Eduardo Castillo Vinuesa. I'm from Spain, where I'm currently uh, zooming from, um, currently in Madrid. I'm an architect, or at least I've been trained as an architect, but my practice is very transdisciplinary. I do editorial design, editorial production, curatorial practices, and so on and so forth. And I'm also a terraforming alumni from the last year of terraforming. So this is not the first time I engage with the topics we're gonna see today, I guess, but I'm looking forward to it. So nice to meet you all. Yeah, good to have you here. Christoph Prudako. Is it Daco? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's you. just an abbreviation of my last name. It's kind of long, so I uh, just stuck it together. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, I'm from Canada originally. Um, I'm currently in Hamburg, Germany. Um, I just finished this uh, my MA in design in Iceland. Um, it was like an exploration and translations, basically like speculative media design kind of stuff. Um, and then before that, sort of like contemporary media arts. Um, I've also just been like trying to uh, occupy sort of critical spaces in the sort of like web three discourse and sort of what that means. Um, I'm kind of like LARPing and some stuff right now in that world. It's kind of, I love it and hate it a lot. Um, there's a lot of uh, people you have to deal with that are really hard to stomach in that, uh, in that world. But uh, mostly like it's like technological sort of like stagnation, solidification, and like emancipation. I think these are like the three sort of things um, that I like to look at. Is there actually any developed discourse about network topologies in the Web3 
I guess there's a bit of writing or a bit of discussion about that, no? Yeah, most people just want to get rich, honestly. Um, like, so I, it's, it's hard to find places to have like good conversations about this stuff because most people just like, you know, want to talk about like DeFi, whatever. I don't know. It's so difficult to find sort of progressive spaces. Understood. Yeah, maybe we can uh, dive into it a bit during uh, during some of our sessions. After all, talking about networks of any kind, like I guess that's a good starting point for thinking about you know what kind of normativity does space or some spatial organization bring into politics and so on. Yeah. Good. Uh, Paige, Emery. Hi, I'm Paige. I'm coming from. Tongva land, Los Angeles, California, in a time zone where I need to get my brain to wake up this early. Um, I'm a multidisciplinary artist exploring the ecological body and interactions between external landscape and internal landscape. And um, I'm also an environmental activist, which adds on to my interest in these topics of discussion. Thanks. Uh, what, what is that uh, relation between the external and internal landscape, or is it? How can I imagine it? How can you imagine it? Um, <laughs> there's a lot of things, I guess. I, um, a lot of, um, I guess I explore a lot of like post phenomenology around this about how um, our direct like interactions with the environment as like an extended body and um, really tapping into the awareness of these like internal structures and the relation of how it affects this like um, enmeshed fabric constantly. Um, so I'm really interested in like topological philosophy of like even just relating whether it's metaphorically or literally of um this awareness of um our bodies to our surroundings and uh what's going on in as like an ecosystem um yeah Good. i hope you don't get it's a, yeah, it's I a hope. topic that's hard to, <laughs> to <summarize laughs> right time, so. <laughs> well i hope you will get into the debate about um about um, you know use of metaphors in this topological thinking, it's kind of cornerstone of what okay. what it does in the end. Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely. I, I would love to debate about that. <laughs> All right, Alfredo Lozano. Hi, I am Alfredo. I am from Mexico. I currently based in Mexico City. I studied mathematics and I work in um, creating tools of natural language processing in computer science. And I'm also an artist. Um, for this seminar, I'm interested in the uh, philosophical topology framework um, and what it entails to the construction of utopian thought. Um, but uh, a bit vaguely, of course. So, thank you. So, in case I'm going to talk sorry. about mathematics, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So in case I'm going to talk about mathematics and I say something wrong, you can. You're welcome to 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 correct me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll try. Thanks, Matheus Ferreira. Um, hi, I'm Matheus. I'm from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and I'm currently uh, doing my PhD research in philosophy. And yeah, I'm I'm very interested in these all these topics and. I'm currently studying the these materialistic and and speculative turns in philosophy, and I don't know. I think it's, it has lots of interesting resonance points with the with the bibliography for for the class and and all the themes. So glad to be here. Yeah, I'm also glad you're here. Welcome, Rafael Moscardi Pedroso. Um, hi, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Rafael. I am now based in Guyana. I just finished a uh, master's. At, my whole background is in political theory and international relations. Uh, I have just finished a master's thesis trying to bring together Marxist concept of metabolism and a little bit of media theory in order to think about uh, critical political economy for the Anthropocene and the possibilities of collective management of alienation. And this is why the seminar interests me pretty much. I think it, it uh, builds a lot on that and also uh, helps me set my foot in uh, other fields in which I'm not that familiar with. And uh, also I heard a lot of good things about your work. So I really wanted to, just, uh, to see 
to see how, how you would work around the questions of the seminar. All right, I hope I meet your expectations. And did you say Marx's concept of metabolism or uh, yeah, who's concept yeah. of metabolism? Ah, I see. Marx. Great. Marxist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we're going to get there in the next session. We're, we're going to talk about thermodynamics and metabolism quite a lot. Perfect. Oh, nice. <laughs> Denise, Luna. <laughs> Hi, Denise. <laughs> Hi. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Denise Luna. I am an architect, researcher, and sort of professor here in Mexico. I am a certificate student from, for the Postplanetary Universal Design Program. Um, I'm really excited to see Lucas again um, and learn a lot more from him. Um, he's a brilliant guy, um, so I'm, 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 I'm really happy to be here. Um, to follow up a lot of interesting discussions with, with, with all of you. Um, I guess I'm interested in, um, in an architecture from the theoretical to the practical, devoid of its commonly known references and associations to construct uh, possibilities for world making. But um, that raises questions of what do we, re what do we mean by, by world? What do we mean by planetary? And that's the sort of thing that that I think Lucas is, is very precise um, um, on his thinking and writing. Um, so yeah, I'm basically yeah, here to explore alternative forms of architecture through thinking and practice at the planetary scale. Um, yeah, and, and also what the planetary means, but also what it does uh, more, more than, than, than what it is, right? And, and what are the um, possibilities for, um, for our infrastructures, for design, for basically all of our disciplines, even from, even for um, maybe economical systems, why not, right? Um, it, there, there is no um, boundary, um, at least for me, um, regarding disciplines, right? Yeah, maybe we're going to discover in the end that economics and geoengineering is one and the same thing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Eric Meyer. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Eric. I study sociology and philosophy. I'm located in Bielefeld, Germany right now. And about like one year right in the pandemic, basically, I got really, really frustrated with the, the completely theoretical point of like trajectory of my work. And kind of right now I'm trying to kind of channel the, the skills and the capability, the capacity that I've learned and that those disciplines have given me into thinking about basically thinking about political strategy on and there also the question of okay scale independent strategy so i've been recently i've been experimenting with live streaming a little bit and i'm trying to combine like the level of like the personal life the existential the political and like basically this okay how do different scales intersect and how do you how do you then strategize around the interrelations of those different scales and especially like the, the questions of, okay, I'm, I'm also interested in eco-socialism right now. So the question of, okay, ge the question of geoengineering, question of climate change, how that intersects with economics and everything. Um, yeah, so I'm, I, I'm feeling like I'm kind of a little bit less academic <laughs> because that's not my trajectory that I'm going, but I'm kind of like having more like an instrumental approach. Okay, what I can take from the seminar and not like okay i have to build up my academic portfolio or something and but maybe that's also very interesting and um yeah i'm excited and let me let's see what, what's coming to us yes welcome eric <laughs> Felipe Felizarto. hey uh, i'm philip i'm from lisbon uh, portugal uh i currently live in porto which is uh 300 kilometers up north um I dropped out of the first year of the of the film undergrad 12 years ago and uh, only came back to study right now. Um, I'm in the critical philosophy program at the new center and um, will enroll in an undergrad in philosophy uh, in September. Right now, I'm here because I wanted to get an introduction to Michel Chatelet. Um, I, I think I would like it and this was a seemed like a good chance. I'm interested in the planetary because um, I'm, I'm interested in, at the moment, I'm inter interested in exploring the possibility of uh, formal languages uh, taught in the early infancy or 
uh, creating a um, philosophical pe pedagogical program for the early infancy, uh, which may be a little bit scary, but uh, I do like the experimental uh, tendencies of Marxism, as a colleague of ours said in another seminar. So that's it. Wow, that's extremely interesting. Also, like, does it mean that you're gonna <laughs> let's, teach let's see. children, or uh, you you teach children philosophy, or are you trying to extract some kind of intuition from them for for your work? What's the what's the point? Uh, well, I, I'm a, I'm at no point right now because I have to, I have some I'm a musician. I have uh, I have ex experimented teaching musical autonomy. Uh, to young children, and now I think I want to uh, acquire knowledge, sufficient knowledge to design an experimental uh, pedagogical program with this in view, something like teaching category theory uh, to uh, five-year-olds. <laughs> All right, so when I'm going to talk about category theory today, also please correct me. <laughs> uh, maybe it will happen. Uh, Zenobio Almeida. Hi everyone, I'm Zenobio. I'm a design and researcher from the very northeast of Brazil, currently doing research in speculative design methodologies, especially Breton's hyperfunctional approach. I'm very fond of his ideas about planetarity being a chemical, geological, and astronomical given instead of a cultural or a religious fabrication. And I'm taking this seminar to develop these ideas on what planetary is and to help construct better things, models, concepts to deal with the, the planetary thinking. Thank you. I'm also actually doing this course for the same reason, because I'm developing a new book, which actually should be about this. So ideally, you're going to also your feedback will be very important for the final for the or at least for the for the form of the first draft, let's say. Yeah. Tegan, Dorsch. Hi, guys, I'm Tegan. Um, my background's in architectural design, and I'm currently in London at the Bartlett School of Architecture doing and kind of focusing on sort of spatial embodiment and augmentation of space. And so I'm really interested in sort of working through this planetary scale because I don't typically, my work doesn't typically address this sort of level of thinking. So I'm sort of interested to see how to sort of wrap it through it. Cool, welcome. Uh, Vincent or Vincent Ardidon? It's Vincent, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm a writer and researcher based in Manila. My undergrad degree is in language and literature, and I'm still unsure if I want to pursue um, an MA in the evolving discipline of research architecture. But I'm very much interested in the concept of buoyancy and terminality in relation to spatial organization and uh, the design and fiction of making. Uh, I'm drawn to this course because I think philosophy goes hand in hand with geoengineering if it must respond with our most pressing and current uh, planetary anxieties. That's about it. Welcome, uh, Vince. Vince, that's the right way how to pronounce that. Thank you. Uh, Alex Cruz. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex. I'm a writer, filmmaker, and interdisciplinary artist joining from Oakland, California, which is unceded Ohlone land. Um, I'm also a researcher at the New Center. I'm studying critical philosophy, and my recent work has looked at intersections between uh, media systems, ecologies, and militarized architecture, both in kind of historical and speculative incarnations. And I, yeah, I have an enduring interest in many of the course's topics, and I'm really looking forward to the seminar. Thanks. Thank you. Welcome, Alex. Mustafa El, El Baroudi. Um, hello, everyone. Um, okay, mine is really short. Um, uh, my name is Mustafa El Baroudi. I'm an architect from, uh, from Cairo, Egypt. Um, uh, I have uh, uh, a shifting interest from the, uh, the convention mod modes of practice, uh, the disciplinary modes of practice in the architecture to a more multidisciplinary approach uh, to speculative design and world building in relation to questions uh, like geopolitics, automation, ecology, um, and so on. Um, uh, and yeah, and I'm also uh, a student, uh, a certificate student of this program, uh, uh, the uh, Post-Planetary Universal Design, 
uh, and yeah, I'm hoping to um, build a, a, a theoretical foundation around these uh, questions um, to to start uh, um, a, a more multidisciplinary and a research-based practice uh, or approach to architecture. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Welcome, uh, Anna Loruenko. Hi. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm from Niterói, it's a city near Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, I'm based here. I got a BA in painting and an MA in visual arts in interdisciplinary poetics, actually. And um, I'm researching around how to develop artistic practices and images that can articulate pollination and I see pollination as a web articulation between the micro and microcosmos and planetary. And that's it. I got a lot of interesting on the many topics of the seminar. That's it. Wonderful. Welcome here. I see also Sebastian Brang here. <laughs> Hello. Hey, Lukas. Nice to see you. Um, I'm uh, Sebastian. I'm a writer and editor from Slovenia, I'm, but I'm based in Berlin, Germany. My background is in art history and humanities and philosophy as well. And yeah, I've been recently getting more interested in uh, philosophy of technology, and I've been doing some research on the intersection between the history of cybernetics and aesthetics or art objects more specifically. And I guess the reason that I took this class is because I think it's important to think about new models of universality, but also I think there's this weird conundrum of uh, not really being able to imagine the planetary, but then also kind of like simultaneously needing to do that. So I think it's uh, yeah, um, an important thing to think about at this very moment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good to see you. Uh, Jonathan Kosravani. Kos Kosravani. Yeah, I know you got it right. Yeah, can, can everyone hear me? Um, yeah, hello. Uh, my undergrad, my background is in history, um, but my MA was in international relations, where I did a lot of stuff in the Anthropocene and planetary politics, so over overlaps here, here quite well. And then I'll be starting my PhD in September, focusing on yeah, Anthropocene, climate change, that sort of stuff, and planetary politics just seems like a yeah, good place to start, really. So yeah, nice and quick. Yeah, good place to start. Welcome. And that's a, also a good opportunity to start because it seems like it's been all of you uh, who said a couple of words about yourself. So thanks so much for uh, your introductions. I'm, I'm happy to meet all of you. And before we get into the real topic of the first lecture, I need to do a couple of organizational remarks. And the most important one, I guess, is that I'm aware of uh, some of you actually already finishing your certificate uh, degrees or basically there are people, I think it is Rafael, I think it is Carlo and a few other people who basically already finished and basically do these uh, sessions or do this seminar like on top of their curriculum. Is that right? I, I think so. Yeah. So basically I've been told I'm that- I'm not sure I finished. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm gonna have a look into this. I, I have this. I have this. Uh, uh, I have this Excel sheet. And uh, yeah, yes. uh, Lukash. Yeah. I yeah. Let let me please intervene. Yeah, there uh, yes. there are some uh, people who are so-called certificate students. And uh, in terms of like presentations, we are uh, I suppose uh, have to prioritize these people because. Uh, there is the thing that whether people finish or not uh, their um, certificate depends on uh, whether they uh, make or don't make presentations. And since there are a lot of people, uh, um, we were like both told that. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm trying to be serious, guys. Uh, that I'm. I'm. We're told that uh, 
that uh, it would be fair that we will prioritize in terms of presentations the people who are certificate students. So, and we're supposed to, that you guys are supposed to do like like in every other seminars, presentations and responses. And it would be really great. I will circulate uh, the sign up sheet for uh, the presentations, like just after the class. And it, it would be really great if you just uh, sign up for uh, this sheet, like in like a day or something. Uh, and uh, like we will do it, Lukash. Uh, oh, Lukash, uh, like one more, another question. Uh, uh, how many presentations uh, per class uh, are you like okay to have? Four. For so yes, so we will have like four presentations per class, and uh, in total it will be uh, uh, twelve uh, or <laughs> oh, no. it should be twelve. Yes. <laughs> Sixteen present uh, no no twelve presentations. I'm right. Uh, so yes, that's that's like kind of their their organization stuff. Yes, and twelve presentations means for twenty four people presenting because uh, the presentation should happen in pairs. So actually it will be couples of you uh, presenting together a reading. Uh, those of you that took some of the seminars in the past probably know this. I realized that this is, some, this is probably something that usually happens as the pedagogical activity at the new center. I saw it also when I was talking Daniel Sassilotto's course, the seminar on the philosophy of nature last autumn I saw a lot of people doing these reading assignments and presenting that, but I would really love to ask you for a kind of way how it should be packed and delivered. So given the fact that we have only four, uh, four sessions, uh, I would really like if uh, you manage to do those presentations in pairs, but they are no longer than seven minutes. So it should be something that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share the screen. So actually you can see the way how I imagine it. Uh, it is here in the requirements section of the PDF. So the essential requirement is presentation of a short reading summary from one of the essential readings during the course. What are essential readings? Essential readings you can find at each uh, description of each class. We have some, for the first class, there were no essential readings. And then for the next one, we already have four here. Bentley Allen, Deepesh Chakrabarti, Lisa Messeri, and Gayatri Chakrabarti Spivak. And then there is some further literature that you can consult in, in case you wanna, wanna read more in advance of what we're gonna talk about in the lecture or if you want to revisit it after the, the class is finished. And uh, that's the literature. So the reading summary then should be delivered in a pair. It should be no longer than seven minutes and it should be presenting one notion from the reading, introducing one problem which is related to the notion and posing one question, which is related to the reading. So it should be really packed and it, like a rapid fire presentation where we actually really just revisit the text through in very compressed form, where you just uh, pick the notion that you think was most salient or mo most important for your interpretation. You could develop it into a sort of problematic, which is somehow around the notion, which can help us to contextualize that notion, that concept somehow. And the finish line of the presentation should be, you know, uh, posing and perhaps even meditating on, uh, or answering one question, which is perhaps directly written in the reading. Maybe it's something that the author is, uh, is uh, interested in, but also it can be something that you uh, are interested in. What is your question as, you know, related to the way how you interpret the reading and so on. And so just a couple of other requirements, or they're not just really requirements, but the duration of each seminar is two and a half hours, which is the standard standard length for the new center. And the final grading is based on the presentation of the reading summary. That's the part uh, which is like an in-class part of uh, the activity from which the final grade is composed. Then it is also, of course, about active participation during the sessions. And then uh, another important requirement is that I'm going to assess your final essays, which should be around 2000 words. And we should elaborate on one of the similar topics, which is philosophical topology, the concept of the planetary, then the method of comparative planetology, concept of ecological normativity, and the discourse on geoengineering. 
So the students have, that have already obtained their certificates, or I mean, those that do not, those that need credits, yeah, as uh, Carl put it in the in the in the in the chat window, those that have those that need credits are prioritized, and that means that they have priority in terms of presentations of the reading summaries. So those of you who are certificate students that need to be prioritized are basically those that uh, will present. And those of you that do not need the credits from this seminar will not present and they will only deliver the final essay as the way how I'm going to assess their participation. Does that make sense? I guess uh, Sasha is here to tell you in case uh, there is any problem, in case you don't know whether you are actually obliged or not obliged to deliver the presentation of the reading summary. Uh, and I believe that uh, you're going to form uh, pairs of uh, readers that you're going to be happy with and that we're going to have some perhaps yeah, nice, nice numbers. Yeah. Yeah, I think what uh, what is the bad thing uh, to do is just I will uh, circulate this uh, presentation list uh, list uh, among the certificate students because uh, I have them like selected in this uh, uh, spreadsheet and I will just uh, send it to them like probably later today and then we will just figure it out. Okay, thank you, Sasha, so much. So uh, for the first lecture, which is the lecture that we're going to have today, is uh, focused mainly on the concept of the philosophical topology itself. So also, again, as you can see on the screen, uh, whoops. Yes, so as, as you can actually see on the screen, there's a couple just of further readings that I'm going to talk about a bit today, mainly about Tim Ingold, Benjamin Lazier, Peter Sloterdijk, and Michelle Shuttle, also Deleuze and Guattari and Yuk Hui. So if you want to revisit that, you can have a look at these particular readings after the class. The second class will be about the concept of the planetary itself. That's where we have these four readings uh, that I've already mentioned. The third class is going to focus more on the method of the comparative planetology where we're going to read uh, the Earth Layer chapter from the stack by Ben Bratton, uh, the introduction to a wonderful book by uh, Dennis Cosgrove, which is called Apollo's Eye. And it's about uh, imagination of uh, the Earth in uh, maybe this part of the reading is about the imagination of the Earth in the, in the, anti, in, in the ancient Greece and Rome. And then we are also going to have a reading by Kantan Miyazu uh, on ancestrality from after finished and a lovely essay by Ben Woodard on a world loss and a regret, which will navigate us into the topics of extinction, mourning, ghosts, spectral realms, and other uh, shadow ontologies. Fourth and the concluding uh, lecture is going to focus on the concept that I'm developing at the moment, which is the concept of ecological normativity and related discourse and geoengineering. So that's going to be the lecture where we also going to tie together some of the consequences of, uh, of the debates that we're going to have at these first three sessions. And the assigned readings are quite, uh, I mean, well known at the moment, a book by Holly on uh, which is called After Geoengineering, and then a couple of uh, uh, papers by Nigel Clark and by uh, philosopher Barbara Muraka and Frederike Neuber, which are, let's say, more critical uh, critical examinations of geoengineering and climate engineering, and then a super problematic book by Frederick Neyrat, which is called Unconstructible Earth. And I'm kind of curious how we're going to assess this one, because uh, I have but my, my, I have strong reservations towards the style, how it is written, towards some, um, uh, let's say, um, assumptions that this book sets on the table and how it frames geoengineering per se. So this is also going to be a reading that is going to be important for us as a target for a certain critical elaboration of our own understanding of the geoengineering. So that's it for the readings, for the essential reading. As again, you can see that there's a couple of, couple of associated, uh, for, uh, I mean, further readings that you can, that you can have a look at. So that's it for the plan of the whole seminar. Uh, for the that's the four sessions that we're gonna have, and we're already in the middle of the first one. So I guess that without uh, 
without any hesitation, I would actually like to switch to my presentation. But maybe um, I have a short. You... Yes. I have a short question. Yes. Sorry, mm -hmm. um, in the I think it was in the third or in the second the comparative planetology section. Um, why are there a lot? Why are there Alain de Benoist and Alexander Duguay in, in the further reading list? Ah, because we're going to talk about uh, Benoist and uh, Duguay as examples of, say, thinkers that on the radical right uh, present a sort of, uh, you know, multipolarizing discourse on geopolitics. Okay, yeah, I just yeah. wanted to, okay, context, yeah. Thank like, you. like strong localist responses to the, to, the, mm -hmm. to, the, to the globalist agenda, yeah? Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And also quite prominent in, I mean, uh, I live in Eastern Europe. I think it is quite, uh, even people on the left, like some conservative socialists, let's say, that are, for example, at, in social democracy here in Czech Republic are, for example, their politics is informed by the Benoit. They even have panel discussions with them and so on. So I see that there is a, a sort of, I, I think it's an some, some kind of a stream of, uh, I mean, it's kind of intellectual tradition that also is partly informed, let's say, by some of the things that we're going to discuss today, mainly when we revisit Heidegger and his, uh, uh, his uh, let's say, implicit philosophy of the planet that is scattered uh, among many of his writings and remarks. And yeah, I, I consider that to be something that we have to deal with because, because it's, uh, it is, uh, obviously one of the ways how to get out of this malfunctioning uh, uh, say uh, situation of global modernity and this is the way uh, which is uh, advertised by many by many thinkers on the right and i see that there's a certain you know a certain attraction on localism or a certain way how localism is becoming quite a, a prominent response to the global situation also on the left and uh, maybe we can even do a kind of comparative reading of some authors, let's say, from the anarchist tradition and from the from the far right. And we're going to find that at certain points, their arguments are not that dissimilar in this. Wouldn't there maybe even like um, uh, the connection between like the Nairat text and the like just as a, a sus suspicion? Maybe, maybe. Let's, I don't know. Let's <laughs> test, this, let's test yeah. that hypothesis on the board. Yeah. yeah. I have a kind of short proposition, uh, if it's okay, like uh, when you yes. were saying about uh, comparative readings, I think it mm -hmm. would be uh, would also be kind of productive, uh, like when reading, uh, since you have, you know, like, like, since you have, you don't have really many uh, people from uh, like so called um, second world, I think it would be productive to read uh, someone from an anarchist tradition, uh, but coming from a second world uh, alongside uh, Dugan because uh, otherwise, uh, we will be in a kind of weird situation <laughs> and uh, and like to compare maybe to look at this uh, like a, uh, to understand this as part of a situated uh, perspective I see I so what about Walter Mignolo uh, maybe but I would say like maybe Tlastanova in that case because uh, uh, Madino Tlastano, who is like his co-author mm -hmm. and who is uh, more like more situated, uh, maybe. Mm -hmm. But she like, but like, like maybe shall we discuss this kind of? Yeah, let's discuss that. Like, like it's not in, not in, in the email. Yeah. As part of the seminar. Good. Okay. Yeah. But a great proposition. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, yes. I'm going to jump right into the lecture. Uh, there's quite a th there's quite a lot I want to tell you today, and take this first couple of minutes as a sort of preface to the whole seminar because uh, I'm going to do some very general remarks about the nature of concept, about what is philosophy to me, what is political ecology to me, and so on. So uh, I, I guess the first remark I want to make that I recently realized that every concept. Every single concept in philosophy, in any kind of theory, has a sort of wild nature. And that's also the case with the concept of the planet. Because I imagine it sometimes that you go to some place where you can pick up concepts. So you pick up the concept, you put it into your backpack, and you carry it home. 
And when you unpack it, you realize it has mutated while you were carrying it. So what I want to say is that every concept in this sense have a life of their own. And I believe that the vocation of a philosopher is to bear witness to the path of unfolding of the concepts and to be faithful to the ways how the concept unfolds, to be to somehow care for this trajectory of the concept. In other words, the task of philosopher, I guess, is to trace, to evidence, and to clarify the mutations the concepts are undergoing, for better or worse. And that I, that is something, or that's the way in which I still consider myself to be a bit of a follower of Deleuze and Guattari, at least in one sense, that I believe that to be philosopher means also to be the friend of concepts. And so why should we care about the planet as a philosophical concept today? First, I think that the nature of problems which are rel related to ecology, they demand a thorough perspectival rotation in our conceptual schema. So some old categories needs to be abolished, some crafted anew, and some surprising category relations might emerge on the go. But most importantly, the very nature of ecological problematics seems to me somehow puzzling. Because on the one hand, scholarship in environmental humanities has brought substantial arguments for the deep political and also for deep ethical aspects of climate crisis. But on the other hand, any realization of ecological political program is still far on horizon. So the, the intuition that I will defend here demands us to appreciate the possibility that politicization of ecology is not enough and that it can be even obfuscating. Because maybe political ecology is not an answer, but a question. And the question is, how can be ecology political? It seems to me that the, the first option, the kind of politicization of ecology is something that happens quite often today, but I want to uh, survey or I want to inquire a different trajectory. I want to see what happens when we ecologize the very notion of the political not politicize the ecological. And so the project of this conceptual rotation is what I've tried to sketch in very rough terms in this book essay uh, published by Stralka Press in 2019. And I've spent more than a year now reworking it into the next book. Uh, did any one of you had a chance to read that? Or uh, is there anyone who read just like a chapter or some excerpt from the introduction to comparative planetology? Is there anyone that for example, find some some, something that they dislike in the book, or what is your honest opinion about it? This is a good moment to tell me that. Uh, yeah, it actually helped me a lot to the text that I submitted to the to the new center. It was it was the the book who inspired the the, the text, and yeah, that the the what I what I liked the most was this. I guess five different cosmograms and not actually that we can choose, but actually we can kind of uh, intersect these. And what is most interesting to me is how could we mix them to make another ones, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, mixing the, the earth without us and the expectral earth, mixing mm -hmm. the, the features and the, prop the, the properties to make another and different cosmograms. That's that's the... Yeah, so to use it as a launch pad or a platform for new uh, renderings or new imaginations to occur. Yeah, I mean, that would be that would be the function of the book, really. Mm, but I also, I realized there's something, there's something I personally dislike about the book after reading it, reading it again after it was published. And I've realized that the language is a bit problematic to that extent that it relies too much on poetics. Like sometimes it avoids to be completely precise in formulation because it relies on this intensive cognitive import of poetic language, which sometimes remains too blurry and also ephemeral in its intensity. But I don't know how you assess that. I mean, like to me, poetics is something that is useful as a strategy of writing, but also something that maybe leads to some, sometimes being obfuscating or not precise in the way that I would like to be. Maybe it is then more about what the words do than what the words actually mean. But yeah, I don't know what you, for example, think, think Zenobia about that. It seems that you read the book in full. 
Sorry? I don't know how you find this aspect of the book, like this poetic aspect of the book, whether it's something that was a trouble for you or a problem for you, or whether it was something that was actually useful, that it was yeah, yeah, in a way. Yeah, I found, I, I found it useful in the, in the, in the same way that I, I, I think of the, the, the stack of, of, of Breton as a, as, a, as a brief for a speculative design. And these kind of different uh, words that I that I could and, and these poetics that is usually the in the case of speculative design projects to to make uh, another one yeah but 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 uh, I guess the the the, the functional uh, thing comes maybe after this first conceptual and poetic imagination so so maybe. Maybe we could uh, start with this poetic, mm -hmm. and and that 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 there's also a a, a kind of a uh, a recent lecture by by Nagarastani that he concept conceptualized this poet engineer and <laughs> a kind of a, a, a different uh, a different concept of of the poet like uh, bring from uh, Plato and 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 stuff. And that's that's that could be also useful to, to think about this this cosmology. That's funny. I didn't know I didn't know that he has a lecture on poetic engineering because it's a term I've used also in one of my uh, lectures. But I'm hundred percent sure sure that he didn't so that <laughs> lecture because it was just for Strelka uh, Strelka uh, cohort of the terraforming this year. But this is actually funny because yes, I mean. Uh, why should poetics stand in contradiction to engineering? Like this is like this is the kind of Heideggerian prejudice that technology cannot reveal anything; that it's only obfuscates some nature of things, right? Yeah. And I mean, like to me, like I mean, this I don't know how Rezanegaristan means that. Like to me, it is, I mean, rehabilitating uh, technology as a revelatory practice. Yep. It's Siam lecture. What is that? Is that is it all, is it on YouTube somewhere? It's a recent one. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 recent. I guess it's from this month. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I'm go I'm gonna try to look it up. If you have some link, please share it with me. I'd really like to. Sure. I'd really like yes. Sure, I'm I'm looking for it. Good. Or and in the meantime, uh, let's continue on. I mean, Zenobia is right to say that this is basically something like an alternative design brief or sort of a toolbox for speculative thinking, this introduction to comparative planetology. And that also means that it deals with different ways how we imagine our planet in contemporary and mainly Western cultures. And also it speculates about some unorthodox possibilities to imagine the Earth in the future. And so it has a lot to do with visual cultures, but equally as with, for example, geopolitics and climate crisis. And so to give you a glimpse of what is the main problem of the book, let me make first a very general philosophical observation that today we, at least in the globalized Western culture, we too often rely on framing of the problems in terms of absolute and all encompassing dichotomies, which is also a bit cliche to say, but it's a cliche that still, I guess, leads to one important observation. You know all these dichotomies like mind and body, subjectivity and objectivity, interior and exterior, freedom and determination, and so and so on. Although we also see that many times uh, the aim of these uh, dichotomies is not to bring some moment of reconciliation, but instead it is about acknowledging that there is a certain tension or a certain perplexity between these dichotomies, but. Uh, some absolute dichotomies, to me, it seems that they do not produce perplexities anymore. And instead, they lead to some toxic obstacles that prevent us from achieving some important social and also some important political decisions. And one of these absolute dichotomies, the one that I'm concer concerned with in my Lokash.
I have WhatsApp. I have WhatsApp team, so let's wait. I'm back. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Back. This may. Yes, this may happen uh, for some reason. Uh, it seems that uh, I, I've paid for the fastest internet connection in the Prague and still it fails all the time, especially when I lecture. So um, I cannot do anything more about this. It's optical cable. It, I mean, I pay quite a significant amount of money for that and still this happens. I'm sorry for that. Right, so I was talking about uh, how your local choices have consequences of other distant localities, how the Greenland uh, um, ice, ice melting causes the drowning of the whole countries in Oceania, and so on, and so on. So instead of dichotomy, we see here a clear continuum between what happens in our immediate surrounding and what happens to the planet. We need a better imagination then, I guess. And that's a diagnosis that also approximates this great sociologist whose name is Kelly Marie Norgard, when she formulates the need for a kind of stereoscopic imagination composed of the ecological and the sociological part, ecological and sociological imagination applied to climate catastrophe. So on the one hand, ecological imagination, according to Kelly Marie Norgard, is uh, an ability to perceive the relationships between human actions and their effects on Earth's biophysical system. That's the ecological part. And then we have the part which is called soci sociological imagination, which captures the relationships within society that make up the environmentally damaging social structure. And so uh, my proposal then is to do a little gesture of sometimes much needed philosophical abstraction and to integrate this sociological and ecological imagination under a common banner. So in my book, this common banner is the philosophical concept of the planetary. So what is this kind of thing? What is the planetary? This is still the preface of the whole lecture. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to tell you my very like an elevator pitch version of what is the planetary for me. And we can discuss it more in the sessions to come. So there is a rapidly increasing literature on this topic of the planetary. It encompasses many fields of uh, humanities and social sciences, political theory, post-colonial studies, international relations. It's also in philosophy of design or in science and technology studies, and of course also environmental thinking. And probably the first person who used this term consistently and rigorously was Indian post-colonial scholar Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak in her 2003 book called The Death of a Discipline. So there she defines the planetary in her typically poetic way, leaving enough vagueness in the concept to let others further elaborate on it. And she says that the planetary indicates disenchantment and also defamiliarization of the home, or as the famous quotation by her goes, the planet is in the rules of the galaxy and we cannot touch it. And that's nice. And alongside thinkers like Spivak, I also ground my view in the studies of ecological economics that sees economic processes as also always natural processes in the sense that they can be seen as biological, as physical, and chemical processes and transformations. That is the quote of, uh, that comes from an important contemporary ecological economist whose name is Inge Repke. And for this reason, she also thinks that economic processes should consequent, consequently be conceptualized in terms usually used to describe processes in nature. And now, uh, based on this quotation, I make something like a general observation that uh, can be br broken down to three important moments. The first moment is that we see that there is a possibility for a view of socioeconomic realm as a continuum of biochemical and geophysical processes. So that's the first thing. The second thing that is important here is that there is a possibility of a metabolic picture of this continuum, to use the term metabolism as something like a unifying concept to express this continuum. The planet can be then viewed as a conglomeration of nested metabolic processes of energy, of matter, perhaps also of information, depends on your ontology, but we humans, 
are embedded in these various metabolisms as mediators or intermediaries. Uh, that's the, so that's the second part of the observation. And then the third thing is that there is obviously a possibility of the language that can express this continuum in unified terms. So the metabolism is probably one of the cornerstones of this language or of this vocabulary, but let's see how many other concepts we might need on the go. And what I've just told you, that's basically a brief pre preface to what we're going to do in this seminar. Uh, and before we jump further into, I mean, before we get deeper into my philosophical proposition, I would like to collect some additional intuitions because uh, this is the part that can be actually quite familiar to you, especially if you read Introduction to Comparative Planetology. And that's the part that I'm going to talk about a bit now where I'm gonna tie these uh, introductory remarks to the concepts related to geopolitics and to a certain interpretation of the relation between comparative planetology and geopolitics. So uh, I believe that many of you know Bruno Latour. He's one of the giants of uh, contemporary political ecology, although recently writing things that became for many thinkers increasingly problematic. One of those problematic writings is the Down to Earth Manifesto, which I guess was published in, uh, in um, in English, I think it was 2018 when it was published. And he mar Latour notes there that today it becomes abundantly clear that the climate crisis is not simply a political problem because we need to speak about climate crisis as a geopolitical problem because it transcends nation state boundaries in the causes and in its effects. However, as we have repeatedly seen since the Rio de Janeiro 1992, the first climate summit ever assembled, and even despite uh, many successful or at least partially successful uh, climate summits, such as uh, Paris 2005, 2015, where the Paris Climate Agreement was signed or agreed on. So uh, we see that attempts to coordinate climate emergency mitigation still do not reach satisfactory results. It may occur to someone that a lot has changed thanks to the new Biden administration in the US, but in fact, while countries such as Brazil will continue their deforestation, deforestation campaigns, while American or Russian corporations will continue drilling oil and shipping in world wild, and while Western countries, as well as India and China, will continue to be hesitant about taking the lead in the truly global action against runaway global heating, the geopolitical situation of climate appeasement will continue to be the case. Or we will be left at best with a popular saying, too little, too late. And to better illustrate these failures, we might observe an alarming trend of climate injustice because it is countries of Oceania, of Africa, of Southeast Asia, or of Latin America that are the first frontal line of climate emergency. And it is these countries that already suffer from the climate crisis disproportionately more than countries of the global north. And so it has to do with uh, their geography and climate, of course, but also with, it has a lot to do with limited funds, limited capital, limited, limited means they have for climate mitigation. And so seeing this space of geopolitical climate failure, it might be time to reconsider better this geopolitical dimension of the climate crisis that was observed by Latour, shouldn't we rendered anew. And that can mean, among other things, to reassess the duality of the global and the local and the role of nation states as sovereign actors of ecological geopolitics. And that also means that at the first place, we need to abandon this kind of Westphalian condition that gives rise to the situation of globalization. And under these conditions, nation states are still treated as subjects of global action, while in fact, they are actually losing the capacity to control global affairs. So we need a better conceptual machinery at, at our disposal, as already said. And that would be a kind of conceptual machinery that would allow us to understand a new, what is the geo in geopolitical. So instead of the dichotomy of the global and the local, it may provide a framing of the geo as the planetary. That means as a clear continuum between what happens in our immediate surroundings and what happens to the planet. Staying faithful to this metabolic intuition 
that we saw in the preface when we were when we were meeting with this quotation uh, by Inge Repke. Or in other words, we can say that we must make clear what actually is the object that we want to save from runaway climate catastrophe. That is what we, what, what we talk about when we talk about the planet. And that is exactly the business of comparative planetology as a philosophical genre. So uh, usually at this moment, I like to refer to Kim Stanley Robinson and uh, one of the interviews he made with Jeff Maino where he characterized comparative planetology as a science that compares different celestial bodies in terms of the composition of their atmosphere or soil, in terms of the, the geological and geophysical processes that happen on, uh, on, these, uh, on these different planets. But actually, we don't have to refer to a science fiction writer to define comparative planetology because it is really an actual part of astronomy. It really exists as an exact, as an empirical science. But in my account, uh, <laughs> what does it mean putting the Stan in Kim Stanley Robinson? No, Stan, Stan is like an internet slang for fan or someone who is obsessed with somebody. And yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've been using Ministry for the Future myself and I'm obsessed. And yeah, yeah, just a joke. <laughs> Still have 100 pages to finish that one, the Ministry of the Future. But it's a wonderful book. Also a bit, I, but also I feel like the way how he wrote that is um, there's so many narrative threads. Sometimes I get a bit lost in it. But whatever. I mean, he's still a great writer, of course. But uh, going back to comparative planetology, my account is not that of an exact or empirical science. For me, this is really about uh, constructing some philosophical genre that would study different visual and different philosophical cultures of imagining our own planet. And what is important, comparative planetology maps these cultures and these imaginations into a geopolitical realm because different imaginations of the planet reflect different geopolitical arrangements. And these geopolitical spaces are then crucially translated into different geophysical and different biochemical realities on the planetary scale. So we see that we are work, working in this kind of triangular, triangular relation. And to explain or to illustrate a bit, uh, what does it mean actually? This mapping between geopolitics and geochemistry, let's say. Uh, think about this case from 2000, September 2019, an EU, EU considering to declare a potential no deal Brexit as a major natural disaster. And I guess that in this EU, a European Union made perhaps unwittingly a gesture towards understanding this translation of geopolitics into chemistry and vice versa. Just to explain that. Uh, the socioeconomic consequences of Britain leaving the EU can be also interpreted as a planetary event, maybe a chemical event or physical event in a way, just as, for example, a trade war between two countries or conflicts about uh, oil resources in the Middle East. Because in all these cases, the slowdown of international trade, which is affected by such events, can be mapped into relative fluctuations in CO2 emissions or in resource, resource extraction or there's many other, uh, let's say, chemical or physical indicators we can associate with different geopolitical events. Another example, actually an example that, I mean, fortunately, we don't have to take this uh, as uh, an official agenda of the US uh, diplomacy anymore. But they were times back in 2019 when fossil fuels have been rebranded as molecules of freedom by the former US Department of Energy. And this also unveils the link between politics and chemistry in how certain chemical elements become indexes or mappings of certain political values. And then also the spreading of a certain concept of freedom as a political concept. For example, uh, an ideation of freedom or a concept of freedom, which is uh, you know, embodied in the kind of free market fundamentalism picture. This, the spreading of such a concept of freedom is then also tethered or it equals spreading of certain chemical elements, for example, carbohydrates. And I'm not sure about this at the moment because I see many other examples of this popping up, like maybe va vaccination geopolitics can be another example of tethering certain values and certain political ideas to certain, to certain uh, I mean, uh, in this case, biochemical technologies the vaccines 
or we can think about examples when, for example, the spreading of the virus itself is actually a biochemical event in itself that is linked to following or not following certain political uh, belief systems. Like if you believe that your freedom shouldn't be in any way limited, even by chemistry or biochemistry, then probably you will, you will do things that will lead to spreading of the virus and then the spreading of the virus itself becomes a diagram or an indicator of an existence of some belief system. Uh, doesn't make sense. Do you have any other examples of where, where we can see such a tethering between chemistry or physics and politics in such a clear terms? I am I am thinking of uh, there is a very nice text by Andrea Small in which he talks about uh, fossil fuels and the process of valorization and production and so on and I think he has this very he has this very nice little phrase in which he tethers a valorization to combustion so like it's a process that always involves the deliberation of co2 in the atmosphere so i think that uh, it sort of uh, exemplifies that quite well i think that saskia sassen has also uh, worked in in that direction of uh, po whole populations that are dislocated through production so like you have uh, you sort of ruin a plot of land and uh, then you have you have to like expel this whole populations and all the expenditures that go go back to the state. So like you reallocate the you have all the gains and all the costs you already reallocate them to like the state or humanitarian institutions and or or even like uh, privatized humanitarian institutions. So it always keeps within this cycle. This is great. I think that this this is a great example, and I think that now we have a very solid grasp of what we're talking about here. Uh, this kind of triangular, this kind of triangular diagram between certain imaginations, certain geopolitical regimes, and certain geochemistries. Or this is a placeholder for any kind of natural or planetary, in, um, in um, yeah, natural or planetary or physical, uh, physical uh, aspect of reality. Let's say the origins of fossil capital from water to steam in the British cotton industry. Yes. It's also, is it also something that is related to that uh, fossil capital book, that text, Raphael? Yeah. I think it's sort of a draft version because I think the book comes out, I think three years after the article. So I think it's uh, mm -hmm. sort of a draft that he repeats the argument. Perfect, thank you. Great reference. And so working, working in this triangle, uh, Comparative paleontology that also allows us to ask some questions that can be important for you if you are architects, designer, artists, because we can really uh, place these questions now, like for what earth do we actually design or what the geopolitical tendencies does our imagination of earth actually, uh, actually endorse. And by doing so, comparative paleontology contributes to an emergence of a solid theoretical conceptualization of the planet in contemporary thinking about politics, about media, about design or architecture, because we increasingly refer to terms like planetary entanglements, planetary conditions, the planetary ecosystem, planetary scale computation, planetary megacities, and so on. But when we closely scrutinize these terms, sometimes we discover how these rhetorical gestures might in some cases turn out to be vacuous, especially once they turn into common currency in intellectual cultures. I see it mainly in the art world happening as happened with the concept of, of the Anthropocene. Now, I guess the same fate will have the concept of the planetary. So let's see how philosophy can help here to elaborate on the conceptual underpinnings of this emerging discourse. And to clarify, I think it's really important to talk for a while about why to turn the question of what the planet means today into a philosophical problem. I mean, doesn't it suffice that the planet is of a concern in earth system sciences, in astronomy, and, and etc. I mean, why we need also philosophy here? And I guess there are at least two ways how to justify the role of philosophy here. The first one is based on observation of Czech philosopher, a phenomenologist, Jan Patochka. Uh, actually Husserl's student, who claimed that the problem of philosophy is the world as a wall. 
And it is exactly this thinking about the world as a whole that in the situation of climate emergency becomes an inquiry into the conditions of our planetary existence. And that means that today the world as a whole somehow also relates or equals to the planet. Because, I mean, I would love to make another seminar, perhaps sometimes in the future, which will be not about the concept of the planet, but about the concept of the world, which is of an equal importance, not talking just about planetology, but also about cosmology. We're going to see today for how many philosophers this was uh, like an underlying concept of many of their questionings. Like what is the world and what especially world as a totality, world as some structured world can mean. But uh, there is also another justification of philosophy as a geopolitical tool. And it somehow comes from Carl Schmitt and his conception of the nomos of the earth. Because this conception actually captures precisely the intuition that before you can have geopolitics and before you can have international relations, that means the nomos, you need to define the space first. You need first to define what is the topos. So what is captured here is the, uh, this, the understanding of the space as a birthplace of normativity. No nomos without topos. No geopolitics without the underlying spatial organization. And Ben Bratton's model of the stack is a good example here because it is this vertical topology of the stack that shakes with foundations of Westphalian geopolitics and with models of political agency and of political subjectivity that are associated with liberal Western societies. So this model doesn't parcel the space horizontally as in Schmidt's nomos of the earth, but instead it brings the topology of modular layers, of modular layers, where each of these layers represents a particular cut or a particular incision through the model. And so what we see here is that geopolitics is always then in need of some kind of spatial imagination, be it smooth globe, smooth sphere of Westphalian geopolitics or a layered model, layered uh, vertical topology of the stack. Still, it is a spatial imagination of sort. Still, it is a topological thinking of sort. And so hence also in this respect, geopolitics is in need of some kind of planetary imagination. And so perhaps philosophy as a discipline has the means to deliver it. So now when we unlock this Pandora's box of planetary imagination, we break up with the perspective of the planet as something that can be described only through one perspective. You know, this kind of zero point perspective from nowhere, which is not the same thing as some kind of outside perspective, because that can be actually still a good thing, that can be actually still useful. But a certain multiplicity of perspective seems nevertheless to be vital. And so comparative planetology invites us to think about the multitude of renderings of the Earth. And for the beginning, it identifies five such prototypes or five renderings. Alongside the planetary that I've already mentioned, it is the globe, the terrestrial, Earth without us, and spectral Earth. So you also see that what I'm doing here, is that a moon? Yeah, it's a moon, it's a Luna, yeah. In the, in the picture, right? Still, I mean, it's, it's just an illustration, Carl. I, I know, I know. But see, seeing from the moon, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you also see that what I'm doing here is something very speculative. It seems almost if I were making up conceptions of the planet at my own will, right? But I mean, what I want to, the argument I want to make is that each of these figures is deeply rooted in our cultural imagination and it also suggests different styles and different aims of politics, which means that each figure has different normative implications. So just to illustrate that, there is, uh, you know, uh, there is the false universalism of the globe. Then there is this fragmentation of communities captured in the concept of the terrestrial. And then you have this kind of third term or the third figure, which is the planetary, which brings some kind of possibility of unification or some kind of metabolic picture of the continuum. So that's like a simple di diagram we can work with further. And more on a terminological note, I call these different conceptions of, or renderings of our planet figures because I want to pronounce their spatial connotations. And that also shows how each of these figures is some topological construct of sorts, which means that it is something like a spatial or space-like philosophical object. 
and the very concept of figures. One short question. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Yes. yes please go one short, on. Yeah. One short clarification question. Um, those figures that you present. Um, what's their relation to empirical models? You might say. Like, uh, is, is it that you can evaluate these different figures with, okay, they are more or less adequate to, okay, describe um, empirical and scientific models, or are they purely philosophical and that they can only be evaluated by conceptual discussion? With the planetary, it is both. It is basically something that is on the intersection of uh, a, a, a philosophical object informed by earth system science, by ecology, by astronomy, astrobiology even, and uh, an object or a concept really, uh, a concept that is uh, coming from a certain cultural background and philosophical um, tradition, right? That's the planetary. With uh, some other concepts, this might not be the case. I don't know how we will assess, for example, the globe or the, or the terrestrial in that. The globe seems to be a particular model that many philosophers like to play with, because also it makes a certain kind of critical gesture that it, for example, accuses, um, accuses uh, globality of some kind of extractivist or colonial or in any way uh, somehow alienating, for example, kind of practice or kind of activity. But um, yeah, depends, depends on, on depends that the proportion is not the same, but in each recipe for each of the figure, there is at least at least a pinch or at least like a tablespoon of of uh, of, of natural sciences. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I wanted to tell you a bit more about this concept of the figure because in itself it has quite a quite a philosophical history. Uh, and that's actually, I'm gonna do four excursions to four, uh, uh, four readings that uh, we can associate with, the, with, this first, with, with this first seminar. And the first of these excursions actually leads us to Deleuze and Guattari and to, to their concept of geophilosophy. Uh, especially that the geophilosophy is uh, the part of uh, what is philosophy, the book that they consider to be perhaps the most uh, uh, the most uh, comprehend comprehensive and also like the most accessible work of these two thinkers. And it's the fourth chapter of what is, of what is philosophy, the chapter on geo geophilosophy. And I don't know, have any of you read this book on, uh, on what is philosophy by Deleuze and Guattari? Maybe you, Carl or Raphael? Yes, but it's, it's been some time. Yes, yes. <laughs> and so it left no impression or did it? Did it? It's not, not as much as some of their other work, I think, and perhaps not on, on me at least, not as much as Deleuze's earlier work. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. But what is important in this book is that, especially in this chapter, is that um, they, they think about figures as contents of pre-philosophical thinking. So they example, their example is mythology, religious thinking. That, that's where figures appear. And these figures is, is what lays ground for philosophical concepts to appear afterwards. So they, they become something like a, an announcement of the emergence of the philosophical, of the philosophical, as they would say in their jargon, plane of immanence, if you will. And in introduction to comparative planetology, this talking about figures had a special role as well, because it indicated that I'm looking for some common motives under the disparate currents of mostly Western philosophy and culture. And also that there is a rudimentary relation of spatiality that is signaled by the connotations of the term figure. You know, connotations that oscillate between something pictorial, something diagrammatic, something formal, and even something personal. But there is more to the and Guattari when it comes to being somehow predecessors of the planetary thinking. Take the main claim of their chapter on geophilosophy, which is, uh, it actually comes in the very first paragraph. Thinking is neither a line drawn between subject and object, nor a revolving of one around the other. Rather, thinking takes place in the relationship of territory and the earth. 
And that's a kind of claim we can actually visualize quite well. The first diagram and the second diagram capture the first part of the quotation. The thinking is neither a line drawn between subject and object, nor a revolving of one around the other. So the first diagram is pretty straightforward. But it is the kind of diagram where thinking is imagined as a relationship of, of representation or some kind of aboutness of the subjective content with respect to external objects. The second diagram unveils the reference to Immanuel Kant, which is hidden in, uh, in the claim in, in this game, when we talk about revolving of subject around object or revolving around object around subject. It is this kind of you know, Kantian Copernican term that as, as he writes in the Critique of Pure Reason that up to that point, philosophers imagined the relationship between subject and object that it is object that it is subject that revolves around objects that somehow organize the experience of the subject and Kant makes this kind of Copernican gesture right that instead he focuses on the organizing quality of subject with respect to how this object appears and that's the reason why he places the subject to the center of the model an object on the orbit around the subject and the third diagram is altogether different perspective it is a kind of perspective when, where thinking, thought process, including categories of subjectivity and objectivity, is some kind of flux with Earth as the engine and territory as the checkpoints or some navigation fixation points. You know, the territories Deleuze and Guattari refer to are, for example, Greece or the city states in the Greece, France, Germany. It's Eurocentric, of course, but given where they come from, also given the fact that they are French and they talk quite a lot, a lot about German philosophers, there's this kind of always present tension between these two intellectual traditions that also the Les Anguateri in that chapter refer to and elaborate on. But that's not that important. What is important really is to, uh, to, to, to understand what is going on in this quotation by the Les Anguateri is that there is a uh, there is the moment where basically what is indicated in the claim is a shift from being to becoming. That thinking is not an aspect of a particular mode of being, for example, being human, but it is a part of a larger general process of becoming, which doesn't concern just human entities, but any kind of object. And there's also a very Spinozian moment in the Les Anguateri, but what we see here at the first place is something very typical for Deleuze in general. This is this kind of reversal of attribution of epistemological categories. Those epistemological categories such as thinking or apprehension that are usually you know, distributed among the standard bearers of these categories like subject and object. So these categories are instead invested back into the world itself as more trivial properties of the inhuman reality. Because consider this citation. The earth constantly carries out a movement of deterritorialization on the spot by which it goes beyond any territory. It is deterritorialized and deterritorialized. It merges with the, mo with the movement. This is a beautiful part of the quotation. It merges with the movement of those who leave their territory en masse with crayfish that set off walking in a file at the bottom of the water with pilgrims or knights who write a celestial line of flight that's the nice part, and now they drop the big, the big claim. The earth is not one element among others, but rather it brings together all the elements within a single embrace while using one or another of them to, de to, to deterritorialize territory. So what does it mean is that in this geophilosophy of Deleuze and Guattari, earth is considered to be something procedural, something metabolic, something dynamic, it is an agent of becoming. And we humans are being something like becomers with the earth. And it is especially relevant when it comes to their epistemology because to apprehend means to become the thing apprehended, to become inhuman. So thinking, cognition for Deleuze and Guattari is a constant becoming something else. It is this continual process of becoming inhuman in their philosophy. And that's also the crux of geophilosophy in this respect. And it is relevant to me as a seed of inspiration for treating the planetary as a procedural category as well. And also a category that can serve as a condition of thinking itself, I guess. And it is exactly then this kind of conditional aspect of the planetary that I'm going to focus more on in, in the rest of this lecture. 
because this conditioning is an instance of the typical job of philosophical topology. It is about providing the basic landscape in which thinking occurs, thinking that is formed and deformed by the curvatures of the landscape. All right, and that also means that uh, it's time to make another general philosophical observation and to pull the level of abstraction really high because we are at the moment when we can see that comparative planetology is in itself just an application or some kind of case study of very wide and very versatile style of thinking, which is what I call actually philosophical topology. And this kind of style of thinking is based on a very simple observation. The observation is that thinking in the last instance always happens in spatial or in space-like terms. And you can hear, I hope, the Deleuzean inspiration here. Take, for example, this uh, very simple and very incomplete list of uh, different spatial terms that we can find in philosophy. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you look better at it, you can see some categories emerging, like some of these concepts are uh, explicitly spatial, like networks, boundaries, gaps, cleavages. Some of them are, uh, some of them refer to concepts of space with some specific qualities, like smooth versus triadic space, logical space, conceptual space. And then uh, some of these uh, spatial terms in philosophy are not exactly spatial, but they approximate something that can be imagined spatially, like domains, realms, continua. And uh, that's also the moment where we can do another excursus into, into, into the readings that or to very classical, uh, classical attempt to formulate a topological research program in environmental humanities. It comes from the essay by Tim Ingold from 1993, which is called Globes and Spheres. And in this essay, Ingold, with respect to human observer, juxtaposes a situated perspective of a sphere or of life world to a view from nowhere, as he says, quote unquote, view from nowhere perspective of the globe. This second perspective, the view from nowhere perspective, is exemplified by the pictures of the Earth from the outer space, and it is criticized by Ingold as a source of alienation and even as a sense, I mean, as a source of a false sense of control over the planetary environment. That's me using Ingold's words, words now. And to understand this argument better, Ingold defines the notion of environment as a function of surrounding. So environment is something that surrounds. And then he asks, does the environment really surround us or do we surround the environment? Because to him, this kind of discourse on global environment that he's referring to back in 1993, to him, it appears to be a peak moment of the separation of the human from the environmental, not of some kind of reintegration or of you know, some kind of ecological awareness as sometimes it is argued. So Ingold's point is critical and it is illustrated by this diagram as well, that on the one hand, you have the sphere or life world, and then you have globe as two different spatial models of how we imagine our relationship with the environment. Uh, sorry, Carl. Can you explain me a bit more this uh, this question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. I mean, th there are there are a few points I'm I'm sort of getting stuck over. Uh, I, I just mm -hmm. wonder, sort of, we we, we be, it seems to me that we are beginning here. I haven't heard everything yet, of course, that you're going to say because that would be, uh, <laughs> but uh, because you haven't said it yet. But uh, I, I wonder. Yeah. Um, I mean, are can, can we sort of go from the claim that, that there are many? That sort of there are an abundance of spatial metaphors and spatial terms to describe thinking to sort of saying that there is something spatial about thinking uh, is it, it, sort of isn't that's a very big you know uh, that seems like a very big leap without without further mm -hmm. justification and i was sort of just just pressing that back to sort of the Deleuze and, and Guattari thing i mm -hmm. i wonder if if that is is that a to what extent is that a helpful source for thinking about the, if you will the primacy of space in in a thought insofar mm -hmm. as they are they are at least the lesson on his own is often claiming sort of that you know um 
intensity in many ways sort of conditions ex extensive properties such as uh, mm -hmm. uh, such as space uh, so so I, I just wonder about sort of how, how are we proceeding here because it's very interesting I'm just trying to sort of follow I see. okay so so far we are in this stage when we are talking about spatial metaphors there is not yet the claim that thinking is somehow essentially topological I don't even think I would sub subscribe to that, to the description of thinking itself as always topological. Although I see many thinkers doing that in, in some, or at least latently. And for example, I remember reading once this uh, essay by Immanuel Kant, which is called How Does Navigate, uh, How to Navigate in Thinking, or something like mm. that. And what does it mean to navigate, navigate one, oneself in thinking? I think it is one of, in a, in one of his later writings, and Sloterdijk refers to it. I will get to Sloterdijk in the moment, and then maybe it will become more clear what is the relation between thinking and topology. But for now, I mean, in this essay by Kant, he says that we have some intuitive, uh, our intuitions about how we proceed in thinking follow from some spatial analogies. For example, the, the very concept of navigation. And I mean, in Kant, there's a lot of geographical metaphor with islands and I mean, seas and oceans and so many, I mean, so many moments when the process of the argument is indispensable from being totally immersed in some topological, uh, in, in the space of some topological metaphors. So, I mean, this is really, this is a key point, of course, what you're, what you're asking about is exactly the moment where we make a leap to something that I'm not 100% sure I want to subscribe to. And that's the thinking of, that's it. Not reflecting about thinking as something that is essentially topological. I don't think that's the case, but I think it is the, a method or a technique that we can use for unlocking certain gestures of thinking. Yeah, I, I think maybe the, the, the underlying question is what, maybe what mm -hmm. is the relationship between um, dimensionality and, and thinking? And, and maybe following from that, what, what is the nature of thinking itself, as, as you've been saying? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I just wanted to sort of see, see a bit sort of where this was, was going. So thank you. Thank you for answering. That, does it, is it clearer now that I want to I, stay, I don't, I, I don't want to avoid a strong ontological commitment. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 think, I think so. I was just slightly worried yeah. that sort of that I saw this happen, happening without uh, being on, following. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks so much for this. It is also Matthews in the chat makes a good comment that extremely visual animals have a strong tendency to think topologically. And this is a great observation because again, what we see here is a link between visual, between the visual and the topological. I hope we will get to that when we're gonna talk about diagrams at the end of this lecture, or maybe we will have to actually leave it for another another session because I still have to go through Ingold and Sloterdijk to get to the diagram. So maybe we will not even get there to there. But uh, let me get back into my stream of thinking. Uh, let me get back to this diagram by Ingold uh, where he juxtaposes globes to spheres, globes to life worlds. Uh, a significant thing about this argument by Ingold is that uh, any kind of first person up close and intimate relationship with the global picture is a priori forbidden in Ingold's analysis. So he says that we live, uh, we live our life in a close proximity to the ground and hence any kind of global awareness is for Ingold phenomenologically unobtainable. Or as this quotation goes, the global environment is not a life world. It is a world apart from life. And this claim is then supported by a series of more or less, uh, I mean, I guess these claims are kind of dubious, like this analysis of the acoustic properties of both English terms, that something of the difference in connotation between globe and sphere is suggested in their very acoustic resonance. Globe is hard and consonant, uh, consonantal, sphere soft and vocalic. You know, uh, he actually has a couple of pages about these acoustic arguments in the essay because it is for the reinforced, for example, in the, in the reading uh, that revisits cosmologies of ancient Greece, where cosmos was made of concentric spheres that were invisible to human eye, but could be listened to as they moved. 
hence the harmony of the universe expressed by the music of the spheres and other cosmological cos cosmological cosmological ideas but on contrary the global outlook is based for encode not on the acoustic but on the visual knowledge of the world is obtained by looking at the world from the perspective of some kind of disinterested external spectator and of course it's a kind of observant status that has been an exclusive domain of the god in the middle east uh, in the middle ages and modernity secularizes the status and bakes it into scientific epistemology or so Ingold's argument goes. Needless to say, Ingold's argument is tiring and kind of worn out because, you know, it's the kind of argument that posits this kind of the view as some attempt to violently abstract and homogenize the situated lived experience on the ground. And it has been repeated actually in the history of humanity so many times, and yet it always comes back as a charming menace of latently Heideggerian intellectual if you will. And so this goes as far as that towards the end, Ingold juxtaposes technology to cosmology. And he says that cosmology provides the guiding principles for human action within the world. Technology provides the principles for human action upon the world. The first is okay, the second is not okay, because the latter is a result of the envisioning the, globe, the world as a globe. That means as a blank space for imposition of human categories and of the appropriation of the world by collective humanity. And I'm going to continue in this exposition of uh, Ingold leading to Heidegger and then to Sloterdijk. And we have last, last 45 minutes now. So I will make a very quick break just to get uh, uh, a water and to refresh a bit. And I'll, let's, let's be back in like two, three minutes. I, I, I just think I need a break because I'm talking for almost two hours now. And maybe also you need a bit of refreshment. Is that fine? Yeah, okay. So I'll be, I'll be back in, in a couple of, in like two or three minutes.
All right, let's come back for the last couple of, uh, I'm like 10, uh, I mean, we have like 30 minutes, 40 minutes left. And I see a great discussion about Badil. That's something that I would really like to explore more about. Actually, I haven't read Logics of Word yet, so I don't know like where this may, may lead, but I understand Badil as using topology as a kind of transitory, as a kind of transitory method, like to basically send objects from one realm to another, or uh, I guess that also approximates the way how metaphor is understood in shuttleless thinking as this kind of uh, technique for sending structures or sending categories from one realm to another. For example, sending uh, structures from the geometry to the algebra and then to the logic and again doing these kinds of uh, like big transits. Fernando Zalamea in his book about uh, a synthetic philosophy of contemporary mathematics also talks about this quite a lot in relation to Alexander Grothendieck and other great mathematicians of the 20th century. And talking about materialism, that's something I don't know a lot about, like what actually means uh, by you, by his materialism. If anyone knows, it would really help me to understand logics of work better, at least the introduction that I've read so far. <laughs> Eric? Um, yeah. I have only uh, one text in mind. Uh, sorry, okay. uh, I'm just yes, saying quick. Um, I have only one text in mind because uh, I think it's on theory of the subject. There is a particular essay in which he comments on uh, Althusser, I think. And he makes a whole like a sort of a table in which he sets out between the uh, materialism of the axiomatic, which would be like on the utmost form, like the structuralists, so Levi Strauss, Saussure, and so on, and uh, a materialism of the topological, which would be like uh, Deleuze and, and uh, Leibniz, the whole Deleuze lineage, basically. And uh, I think I think that he sort of tried to be there, like in the middle but he's still like very much veering towards the axiomatic like in a lot in a lot of ways mm -hmm. even through this text but also i think through this other words which i don't know very well and uh i think that uh, but what we were talking about would be like uh I, I think there is a sort of a difference in uh in those kinds of materialisms because there is on the one hand particularly in the marxist guys uh in the one hand you have this uh this sort of a materialism without matter, which is uh, uh, the whole formalism of the value form school and everything. And on the other hand, you have uh, this uh, Marxist materialism of matter, which uh, would be the Marxist conceptions of metabolism and uh, so on, like uh, Marxist ecology, John Bellamy Foster and that lineage. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I think that uh, there's not an incompatibility between them. I think that uh, at least where I see they diverging the most, uh it would be on the on the subject on the status of like naturalizing or not naturalizing the subject how to naturalize that which is not something that they get to a lot to be quite honest like it's always uh because they are concerned uh with very different problems uh, a lot of the people on the eco-socialist side are very much concerned with uh like assessing the impacts of capital and like what would be the a sort a sort of a nice critical political economy through this axis and the rest of the people are much more philosophically inclined i would say so like i think there is a common ground between them but i'm not really sure where that common ground would take us in this relationship between the axiomatic and the topological but isn't a logics of words something like an attempt to bridge this axiomatic and the topological I yeah, mean, I haven't read that, it as so, well, yeah. but I, I speculate that it would be. <laughs> I'm not so sure about it. All right, yeah, so yeah, I'm going to have a look at that. Maybe we can revisit that during the next sessions. That would be a good idea. Thanks so much for this remark. Yes, anyone else? Eric? Yeah, uh, my question with regards to the um, Tim Ingold, or what was his name, and the diagram between like, okay, um, being located inside an environment and watching like out seeing the environment in its whole from the outside um my comment like isn't that super easy to just dissolve and saying yeah okay we are working with nested systems we are always what like we are always inside certain environments like you can't not be inside an environment uh rather than whether That's or not exactly slotterdijk's argument and, argument slotterdijk basically says that it is existence is like, always about being in something yeah, but also like we're always like watching 
on things from the outside or also or like i'm watching my computer setup right now which is a system which works together like it's always both and like there isn't really like it's an easy to dissolve dichotomy and <laughs> and still we have full traditional 20th century philosophy working with this dichotomy why <laughs> i mean <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Ignoring it's, it sounds theory. easy, but it is, you know, it's it's ex extre extremely charming argument for anyone that wants to privilege the perspective of uh, situated uh, observer and this kind of perspective of ethics, of personal freedom, of any kind of, you know, valuing the individual as the as the as the basis of some kind of political agenda. I guess that's uh, that's why. Uh, these arguments are still made today. Also, by Sloterdijk makes these arguments that he says that in the end, globalization is like uh, the like globalization is conclusion of a long process of interiorization, where you basically make the world into a giant shelter, and inside that shelter, inside that hot house of modernity, as he would say, we basically fill that uh, fill the air of this hot house with uh, some kind of homogenizing substance. Sometimes I even, even imagine it like speaking about a philosopher that is he's a, a philosopher that speaks about um, global heating in this way of the that this you know homogenizing substance can be CO two in a way, but yeah I mean this is the argument that has this um, quality of loving for a certain kind of critique of uh, of uh, of uh, in the end. Uh, some colonial endeavors as well, or some kind of, you know, imperial claims. So it has this you know, like double quality. It is something that sounds very conservative, but for many thinkers, it has uh, it it has actually uh, a use in setting up some progressive political agenda, if you will. I don't know what are your thoughts on that. Like anyone else who wants to jump into this, we will be moving forward a bit faster because we're already talking about Sloterdijk at the moment. But let me maybe let's go back to the to, to the argument because from Ingold we get to Heidegger, from Heidegger we get to Sloterdijk, and from Sloterdijk we can get somewhere that we really want to go. Right? It's this is real more like a literature review part of the world seminar where we also see like what are the thinkers, what are the concepts that other contemporary authors play with, and how we can formulate some kind of opposition to that. That's going to be also the agenda of the next sessions. So uh, where I want to continue with Ingold, uh, I was talking about about I was talking about this distinction between globes and sphere, these acoustic resonances that he was talking, this kind of argument about the acoustic versus visual, and uh, that leads me to the third because Ingold's argument is somehow in line with Heidegger Heideggerian Heideggerian critique of modernity. I don't know whether you had chance to read this. Uh, Quite a quite good text by Benjamin Lazier, which is uh, a summary of the arguments of some 20th century thinkers when they encountered the first pictures of the earth from above, like uh, Hannah Arendt, Huster, but also Heidegger. And the main the main takeaway, or I mean the initial takeaway we can take from from the from the reading is that what happened when Heidegger saw the first image of the earth from above, he freaked out. In the age of the world picture, Heidegger claims that the fundamental event of the modern age is the conquest of the world as a picture. That's a, at the first glance, it's a very weird, weird sentence. Like, what does it mean, the conquest of the world as a picture? Well, this is actually the quotation that comes from Benjamin Lazier's paper and explains the thing quite well. Because world picture, as uh, Lazier explains, is the English equivalent of Weltbild the German term Weltbild. Heidegger did not use it to refer literally to images of the planet. Rather, he meant that the ways we comport ourselves vis-a-vis -vis our natural and human-built worlds are pre-structured by a grasp of the world and everything in it as a picture, as something, that ser something to survey and something to frame for our pleasure and use. Consider in this context the words of Apollo 8 astronaut, Frank Borman. Look at that picture over there. 
The first human to lay eyes on an earth rise made intuitive appeal to a language that is the staple of tourists everywhere to describe not the site itself, but the conditions in which the site could first be disclosed or come into view as its frame. And the notion of frame is, of course, crucial for understanding Heidegger's sweeping critique of modernity. In question concerning technology, Heidegger says that modern technology does the job of inframing the world. This word inframing of the world is, I mean, Heidegger uses this German term gestell for that, this inframing. And this inframing leads to rendering the world as standing reserve. That's another German translation of the word Bestand. And so in a framing standing reserve, where does this lead? It leads to understanding of relation of the world. Uh, I mean, our relation to the world is understood here as facilitated by the modern technology. And this kind of relation makes, I mean, world as a purely as instrumental category. So it is the instrumentality of the world that is revealed in this in framing of the world by modern technology. That's the standing reserve. It means that the world is approached instrumentally, just as pictures having only a function of mediating the accessibility or general penetrability of the world. The subject subjugation of the world to the controlling apparatus of the modern technology itself, and so on and so on, as Heidegger's argument goes. Because where does this lead? It leads to these kinds of lamentations, like everything is functioning, this is exactly what is so uncanny, that everything is functioning and that the functioning drives us more and more to even further functioning and that technology tears men loose from the earth and uproots them. I do not know whether you were frightened, but I at any rate was frightened when I saw pictures coming from the moon to the earth. We don't need any atom bomb. The uprooting of men has already taken place. The only thing we have left is purely technological relationships. This is no longer the earth on which man lives. And so it is with the picture of the earth from above, what Heidegger calls the uprooting of mankind has been concluded. And I, I think that this is a very conservative notion of what pictures can do. Where does, because, uh, where does such an understanding of picture come from? Like think about Walter Benjamin and his text about film and photography. Like he says that, uh, you know, uh, photography and film explode reality all day, somehow like, you know, make reality frozen. And against this kind of understanding of picture as something that is manipulated piece of reality or frozen piece of reality, against this kind of notion, we can juxtapose a more agential or simply more active understanding of, of, of photography and of pictures in general you know, a kind of understanding that would lead to the appreciation of the picture as a continuation of the world by other means. Because consider this example that early thinking about photography really considers technic consider technically produced pictures to be instances of nature revealing itself. Like Etienne Gilles Marais, the founder of chronophotography, who spoke about his famous footage of landing birds and of falling cats, for example, as presenting the language of the phenomena themselves. Uh, or take this citation from The Pencil of Nature by William Fox Talbot, which is actually the very first book illustrated by photographs. He says that the plates of this work have been obtained by the mere action of light upon sensitive paper. They have been formed or depicted by optical and chemical means alone and without the aid of anyone acquainted with the art of drawing. It is needless, therefore, to say that they differ in all respects and as widely as possible in their origin from plates of the ordinary kind, which owe their existence to the united skill of the artist and the engraver. They are impressed by nature's hand. And this understanding of photography as prolonging of natural agency prolonging nature agency of cosmic objects, for example, sun sending rays of light. So this is in direct contrast with, the with this critical view of the photography exposed in the work of Walter Benjamin or Martin Heidegger, which is of course backed by a deep critique of modern technology per se. And as we discover in Benjamin Lazier's essay, the anti-modern sentiment is actually the basis of Heidegger's sympathies to Nazism because Heidegger believed Nazism confronts the crisis of contemporary human being 
encounter, encountering global technology. And what makes Heidegger feel so uneasy is not the planetary scope of the technology, but the phenomenological precedence, the phenomenological precedence of the planetary in any deployment of modern technology, or in other words, the life world is preceded by the globe to say together with Tim Ingold. And the open question which remains here then is, is this a bad thing per se? Is there an alternative understanding of the planetary which leads from this German phrase, planetarisch bestimmten technique, which means in English, not global technology, but the planetarily determined techniques. And I believe that the figure of the global is only one way how to read the precedence of the planet in the establishment of technology and comparative planetology offers ways to practically demonstrate it. And this is the kind of conditioning hypothesis which is shared by some contemporary thinkers. To be sure, Heidegger's claim is that planetary technology brings post-metaphysical world, the world after metaphysics or without metaphysics. And Yukhui, for example, agrees with this thesis, but understands it as a positive challenge to philosophy, perhaps a healthy reminder to catch up with the reality of planetary scale computation. So philosophy must address this kind of condition or it must, or it will risk irrelevance according to Yukhui. And that leads me to the last thinker that we're gonna uh, talk about today. And that's Peter Sloterdijk, uh, who's also following up on Heidegger. His philosophy is basically an answer to the question, what would happen to Heidegger's philosophy if he focused more on space? So Sloterdijk's take is that Heidegger forgot about the spatial dimension of the design's existence. Where he focused more on the issue, he will discover a whole realm of so-called ontotopology, populated with spatial categories like spheres, bubbles, foams, and globes. And this is a kind of ontotopological endeavor that is developed by Sloterdijk on more than 2,500 pages of his trilogy of books, which are prosaically titled Spheres. And I will spare you the part about Sloterdijk's Heideggerianism from the large extent. But uh, with respect to the development of a solid notion of philosophical topology, Sloterdijk seems to me an indispensable reference. It is also a good exercise to highlight a variety, versatility, and creativity of what one can do with topology if it is taken seriously by philosophy. And so what Sloterdijk is really interested about is that he's looking into philosophical analysis of human togetherness, of human intimacy, of human interrelation. And his claim is that intimacy presupposes a particular spatial trope and that's interiority. So if you think about that, to become intimate with something means to incorporate what was outside into the inside in metaphorical sense. And so there is a lot happening in the topological terms because we have here duality of the interior and the exterior. And we also have here a vision of incorporation as a kind of mediation, perhaps an action which is facilitated by some membrane. And what follows from here is that there are different ways how to draw the line between the inside and the outside. And also that there are different regimes of the mediation between the inside and the outside and different porosities of the separating membrane. Main thesis it all leads to is that humans are sphere dwellers, according to Sloterdijk. And that resonates quite well with the Heidegger's concept of dwelling in the world. But Sloterdijk adds, there, adds that before we dwell in the world, world itself being a particle topological category, we already exist in some, in some primordial relation to interiority, to some sphere that is almost equivocal to our being. And so this is why for Sloterdijk, the essential category is the category of being in, being inside, because being is first structured as some kind of inhood, and only afterwards it is being in the world. And this inhood, this kind of archaic interior, is topology of human commonality. It is some kind of shared insight. And Sloterdijk in that sense, or in that respect, makes a reference to what he calls paleopolitics, which is the beginning of human communality in the first sheltering place of our species. The first species, I mean, this first shelter that we occupied, which is the cave. 
And it is the separation of the community from the outside in this place of dwelling where the human sociality emerges and where it also undergoes the first round of its internal structuration. And to explain this, Sloterdijk claims that life is always alive in the midst of lives. If we're going to break down this uh, formulation now. Yes, sheltering places, it's a reference to, <laughs> it's a reference also to the wonderful program, the public program of the new center. But this observation that life is always alive in the midst of lives is absolutely essential for three reasons. The first reason is that we, it seems, follows from Sloterdijk's, from Sloterdijk's claim that we need theory of existential spaciousness. The second thing is already mentioned uh, formulation that life is always alive in the midst of lives. And the third important thing is that what appears here in this fragment is an appeal to media theory as the theory of how and whereby of the connection between different existences. See the last, uh, see the last sentence in this fragment. That means that togetherness is always togetherness of something and something in something. So this kind of interiority, this inhood is something like a philosophical equivalent of some primordial media substance, some kind of quote unquote shared ether. And no wonder that medium originally used to be some kind of transitory or elusive element. I mean, that was the original meaning of the word medium, like gas, like air, before the modern usage of this term occurred, like we talk it about today in terms of media technologies where we use the word medium. It brings us back to some elemental understanding of media, if you will. And this opens the space of looking for historical precedents for such an existential understanding of space, which surprisingly Sloterdijk finds in Christian theology and in the doctrine of Holy Trinity. And it's something that I find really funny because me being from Eastern Europe, I mean, being raised in a very Catholic background, it was quite interesting that suddenly I see a philosopher like Sloterdijk talking about the doctrine of Holy Trinity and Christian theology as something that is in, for him an important reference in relation to thinking about topology, intimacy, sociality, communality. I'm not going to do in, go into this in great detail, but just to, so that you know, uh, basically the, the question is how to explain the con containedness, how contain, containedness of three persons in one God. And Sloterdijk claims that we can find the best topologies in Christian attempts to explain this being in of God in this kind of Trinitarian relationship, that it is something like autospatiality or the production of space that allows for this co-presence or coexistence of these three persons in one God. That's the, that's the way how he links topology to the doctrine of Holy Trinity. And I mean, we can discuss the doctrine of Holy Trinity at some other occasion, of course, because it is quite exciting, but also a bit nerdy topic to discuss in relation to philosophical topology. But one more important insight that we can retrieve from Sloterdijk in relation to planetary thinking is his engagement with globalisms and globalization. And as we are now well aware of, Sloterdijk is positively obsessed with interiors, interiority, Hence, it is no surprise that his analysis of globalization also traces some kind of interiority. And in particular, he takes over a cryptic term from a poem by Rainer Maria Rilke, the German term Welt in and around, which translates as world interior or world interior space. The original part of the poem Sloterdijk refers to goes like this. Through all beings extends the one space, the world interior space. Silently the birds fly to us. Oh, I who want to grow, I look out and the tree grows in me. I care and the house stands in me. And Sloterdijk, surprisingly, takes this as an indication of some consumptive force of capitalist modernity, you know, some kind of digesting and transforming of the world, some kind of narcissistic relation to the world. And that is for Sloterdijk in turn the general picture of globalization as well a kind of disappearance of the outside, followed by a homogenization of the world interior. And this process of disappearance of the outside, this process of the establishment of this world in and around this world interior, it has three stages. And Sloterdijk dates these three stages back to, to ancient Greece, actually, because the first, first stage of global, globalization begins 
with some kind of metaphysical or cosmological globalization, which is really about thinkers such as Parmenide, uh, Pythagoreans or Plato, having some relationship between perfectness or tracing some relation between perfection of being and some geometrical shapes, such as, for example, spheres, globes, as being the ideal manifestation of being. Then we have the second uh, stage, which is already happening in the early modernity, and that's the terrestrial globalization, which is the actual deployment of some kind of, uh, of some kind of, uh, let's say, apparatus of extraction, appara apparatus of colonization, and so on. That's what what is terrestrial globalization for Sloterdijk. And then the third stage that, that we actually, according to, to according to Sloterdijk, occur in now is what he calls electronic globalization, which is this globalization happening through the uh, through the through the dig digital infrastructures, where actually we see not the actual you know geographical extension or a conquest of the territory, but we see instead intensification of this already established uh, global inside this kind of global inhood, this kind of world interior that becomes more and more intensified by the means of communication. I mean, that's the way how Sloterdijk talks about it. And that's it for Sloterdijk. I mean, those are some of the moments that I find important in relation to topology, to philosophical topology when it comes, when it comes to Sloterdijk. And I wonder whether you have any comments or questions at this stage. Yes, Eric? Yeah. Um, mine is, I think, a pretty fundamental question. Um, because you like also like now affirmatively refer to, to Slaughter and that he's important to planetary um, topo uh, philosophical uh, topology and everything. And basically, my question is, especially when it comes to studying like globalization, now talking about globalization, um, why tracing that incredibly complex process back to a few fundamental philosophical principles or dynamics, rather than actually like empirically studying the economic and political trends and the, his and the actual history of that? Um, why do the, my my impression is that when philosophy does something like what Sloterdijk is doing, philosophy massively overestimates its own capacities and oversimplifies the world incredibly. And basically, basically also like it, it robs all, like all other sciences of the capacity. If you treat that philosophy seriously, it, it basically makes all of the uh, incredibly detailed study, empirical studies of that like unnecessary. Like, okay, that's the easy way. Like, you know, you can say a lot about an incredibly complex thing when ha having to do very little work comparatively. But why should we do that? I'm incredibly skeptical of that. And I don't think that really works. And yeah, I want to hear, hear your, your uh, comment on that. Okay, my, the reason why I'm talking affirmatively about Sloterdijk is not because I uh, agree with his... Um, uh, account of globalization, but I see him as one of the prominent thinkers that mobilize topological thinking for reasons that are probably not very uh, politically interesting for us, for you, as well as for me. But uh, that's the part about affirmative, uh, affirmative relationship, having some affirmative relationship to Sloterdijk. Uh, what about the streaming equipment? No, that was just a comment about my mic that I have the best mic and because it's streaming stuff and yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I have a kind of uh, a, a question or maybe, I don't know, a, a, a provocation about this globe. Like I, I recently been in touch in contact with this topological mathematical uh, discourse and I, I saw the, a difference between, uh, in, in, in topological terms, in, in mathematical terms, between sphere and ball, like the ball being the, the inside of the, the, the actually uh, uh, 3D and all this consistent volume, and the sphere just the kind of a surface. And uh, the, the, the globe is actually, uh, the globe is, is actually lag in this, in this is missing in this discourse. 
And I'm wondering about the, the globe being an actually a kind of a, just a, not a material or actually a topological as a, a space, a, a, a spatial uh, thing, an object, but just a, a kind of a linguistic conceptual uh, mixing of all the territories and the cultures that that uh, that that is is just uh, just opposing in, in, instead of actually thinking as a a, a three dimensional or four dimensional object thinking about maybe not an even dimensional uh, thing I, I i don't know i'm i'm, I'm thinking about the, the, this lack of space in, in in globe i understand yeah maybe that's also the good way how to get back into the second part of eric's answer which was also about like whether a philosophical topology or philosophy in general doesn't overestimate itself and it makes these kind of simplistic uh, readings of, uh, for example, a millennium long history or a half a millennium long history. Uh, because yes, uh, the thing is that this makes, um, I really think this, may, this is the way how many philosophers make their, uh, make their claims uh, so appealing and so also critically ele elegant in a way that they basically see, for example, a massive economic process such as, uh, such as the, uh, the spreading of capitalism or the spreading of modernity as not just an economic, but also as a cultural and uh, cultural and say also social, political, historical entity. And it feels to me that uh, mm, the, the reason why we should study this is related a lot to the way how actually, I don't know, I don't, I don't actually have a better starting point at the moment than to rely on these same thinkers and begin thinking with them in order to think behind them. So this is also the reason why I'm uh, engaging so much with Slaughter Day, because despite all of the political commitments I don't agree with, despite these uh, simplifications that uh, Eric nicely put, uh, as Eric nicely put it, when he said that he's extremely skeptical about this, and I think there are good reasons to be skeptical about these kinds of oversimplifying gestures. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I have no better reference point to start with. Also, this is the reference point that for me is the reference point that is shared enough across certain philosophical traditions. May I? Yes, Philippe. Hey, uh, I was um, I was wondering uh, uh, if um, at any mo moment uh, will this uh, the the theme of intersubjectivity be uh, touched upon? Uh, and I was running wondering if it will be so on top of topology or some something like. Uh, like something which precedes the possibility of a topological thinking. Uh, this, this question only came up. Came yes. up. So it's uh, this question came, came up. Mm -hmm. few, uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. This this came up a few minutes ago in my mind, and I'm I'm trying to uh, uh, you know juggle this. <laughs> I'm sorry. So as I was talking now about Sloterdijk, like to him, this is the moment where actually topology comes first before uh, before uh, uh, we talk about intersubjectivity, we talk about this primordial inhood, this kind of topo this this kind of topological construct in which intersubjectivity can occur, or even better said, which is actually that topology is used here to actually understand the form of intersubjectivity and modes and tropes of intersubjectivity because the first volume of the spheres is just about different ways of human togetherness, which we can think about as uh, another way how to talk about intersubject uh, intersubjectivity as well. And for that reason, uh, yeah, for that reason, I think that uh, it still holds. I mean, this is the kind of general hypothesis that this seminar comes with, that we can really make a certain kind of philosophical progress if we place topology first 
and we analyze other problems through the lenses of topology. In this case, the problem of how, what does it mean, what ecology means, what the planetary means, and how, what are the normative implications of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, thinking in planetary terms, of what are the normative implications of this actual kind of landscape that we metaphorically call the planetary. So that's another application of the same method as Lotterdijk uses in order to develop some philosophy of intersubjectivity in this way. Does it make sense, Philip? Okay, thank you. Yeah. 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 It makes. Uh, I'm not familiar with uh, with Sloterdijk's work, but um, I, I was really wondering uh, what would be the the approach. Uh, I may not agree with it, but uh, now I know uh, what's the what are the commitments. Thank you. Any more questions or can someone comment on what is happening in the chat as well? There's a lot of remarks by Eric going on. Yeah, um, I yes. actually had a, a really short uh, clarifying question, I suppose. Uh, and uh, like it, it, it actually, it, it, uh, I wanted to circle back to the beginning of the seminar when, when you were talking mm -hmm. about this uh dichotomy between uh local and global and uh like i do i understand it correct that uh like the mm, the thought behind uh planetology is uh to hold the local and the global like to hold the, the earth on the same analytic analytic plane uh if i understand it right and another thing that has been uh, bothering me, and I know that you have been asked this question recently by someone uh, about like the mm, the concept of compar uh, comparativity, and uh, I was actually wondering how do you use this uh, concept, which is uh, which come which is inherently modern and comes from uh, a certain uh, tradition of. Uh, modern of colonial modernity, I would say, and sorry to use like this particular term. Uh, but uh, I was wondering how you mm, use it uh, to mm, how do you rethink it, I suppose, and how do you work with it? I would put it like this. Yes. Uh, how, 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 how can you, can how you, do you work to with understand? the concept of comparative? Because it's. Yes, uh, but can you I, help me to understand in what terms is uh, comparativity? Colonial? I mean, for um, because like uh, from from where I look, uh, comparative is uh, often used like to compare certain types of plants or like to compare certain uh, types of uh, species, and this is a really uh, particular um, outside perspective which uh, positions the um, observer um, somewhere I can't really um, understand. And it, it is, um, and I'm pretty, I'm like 100% sure you have been uh, thinking about this uh, already. And I'm just really wondering how you, um, how you thought about this. Okay, so I tried to make, make, make this point uh, at the, uh, one of the first slides that uh, comparing in this sense, I don't mean comparing from some, some zero point perspective, but this comparison actually happens more like a series of transits or more like a series, series of mutations of one concept in another. It is not about seeing some, you know, I mean, this, it, it's a, the picture that I've used is very misleading because we saw like five figures of the planet. Yeah, yeah. That some, some, yeah, somehow, somehow, uh, yeah, observed by us. But I don't really think that I, the visual argument is not that this is how we look, this is how we compare things, that we have this perspective from the outside and we compare these figures uh, by choosing one, seeing what it does, then bringing it back uh, and then, then putting it back aside choosing the next one to see how to we can experiment with that one i don't think this is the kind of method 
The method is really more about actually starting with the fact that we have a certain multiplicity of perspectives, but that there are some ways how they can uh, uh, be transformed one into each other, the way how actually in these processes of transformation also the definition of these figures can be somehow uh, you know, uh, formulated. Because if you think about that, there is a genealogical relationship, for example, between the global, the planetary, the terrestrial. These are concepts that have some philosophical history of how they actually uh, come together or how they actually branch, how we can think about the planetary as a certain afterthought on the global or something like a counterthought to the global as this, in the same way as the terrestrial has a certain counter uh, has a certain uh, contrary agenda, contrarian ag agenda to the to the agenda of the global picture. But really, uh, the point is again that uh, we are not looking at these all different frameworks from the outside. We are within that framework, and the multiplicity of the multiplicity of those per perspectives is the part, like the essential feature of that framework. It is not something that. Uh, we juxtapose to some like neutral point of view because the neutral point of view is exactly not the point of view that the comparative ontology loves to. You can have, you can be immersed, you can use a particular figure as a framework through which you render the planet, but you cannot simply have, you know, some kind of neutral rendering that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be already infected with some particular normative propositions about how the planet actually should be, let's say, politically organized or geopolitic, geopolitically structured. And really, this whole lecture is just about surveying the conditions for the planetary thinking to appear. So these conditions sometimes are conditions that come from traditions of philosophy that we do not actually subscribe to. But nevertheless, reading these things, understanding the genealogy or potentials, hidden potentials that were not actually exploited by the thinkers like Heidegger, because I think that the moment, for example, when I was talking about this planetary deter planetarily determined technique, technique in, in Heidegger, I think that's the moment where he actually understood that modern technology presupposes the idea of the planetary, but it actually got never explained, never realized, and never positively assessed. It was just this remark that he made, not really something that had that that became a cornerstone of some solid philosophical approach. That's something I would like to do in the next sessions, actually, to look at the way how we can positively assess this conditioning hypothesis that topology lays grounds for normativity and the planetary lays ground for a specific understanding of the politics that should happen, or, or what is the political within this arena of the planetary, right? Yeah, thank you. This Kind of this kind of mm -hmm. makes sense. Thank, thank. Do we have time for more? And if so, do you want to go first, yes. Sebastian? Since yes. I, since I asked the question already. Ah uh, yeah. Hey, um, so I was just thinking. You talked about the multiplicities of perspectives, and the way I understood it is really not a position of relativism, but it's more kind of like akin to this ontological turn in anthropology, I would say, um, kind of like seeing different, um, yeah, factual existences at the same time. And then I guess we talked about the need to reimagine different multiplicities, right? So, um, and if we are born into, if we come into this world, not in a world that is kind of like some sort of an empty tabula rasa, but in some sort of a world that is already a specific perception of this world, then um, how can we also then make, uh, how can we also allow for this multi different multiplicities to come into being? I guess my question is very broad in general, but I guess how to imagine different cosmologies and what role do aesthetics play in this regard? I mean, this is a, such a huge question. I just uh, made me think of yeah, a more pragmatic way of visualizing a, a, these different um, multiplicities that we talked about. Yes, you write that uh, relativism is not, I mean, like, I, I don't want to be relativist in that way that it wouldn't matter from which perspective we look at the planet. I think it matters, but it is historically contingent. That's the claim. The claim is that actually 
there are certain ways how we imagine the planet which are associated with certain historical epochs with, with certain political and economic systems that are that occurred in these historical epochs and that actually we can foresee and or that we can predict that the planetary will be related to the kind of the cosmological perspective now i'm talking about cosmology more in this cultural than scientific sense that that we can predict that the planetary will be the cornerstone of this upcoming kind of uh, scientific cosmology if you will and so then uh this multiplicity of perspectives i do not mean in the sense that it wouldn't as i said that it wouldn't matter from which perspective you look at but that there are a certain internal principles how we move through these figures how we move from one topology to another and what we can expect in this process of moving from one figure to another so at the same way as we can expect that in the movement from the global to the planetary what will occur will be some series of reconfigurations of some concepts and political values mainly political values related to for example uh questions of agency questions of uh, responsibility questions of related for example to our understanding of liberty and autonomy and so on i think that's something where actually we realize that in a way the comparative planetology is not incompatible with some versions of uh, universalisms. But these universalisms that comparative planetology advertises are not universalisms of uh, imposition of some conceptual categories, but more universalisms of some, let's say, um, topological landscapes or some kind of like, um, yeah, I don't know what's the best way how to frame it than using this duality of the Greek terms uh, pan and holon, which were two Greek terms used for describing totalities. But while holon was a category which was related to closed totalities, pan was a prefix that indicated an open totality, some kind of totality which is actually always worked through, always in the process of becoming, always somehow related to the notion of praxis or practice or activity. And I guess that's the kind of totality that maybe comparative paranthology leans to or leans towards. So I guess that's the that's that's how I would also answer your question, Sebastian, on on this multiplicity of perspectives. Does it is it how do you how do you think about that? What do you think about that? Yeah, um, I, uh, I guess it's important to distinguish these two different concepts of universality as well, as you did mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. now, because I, uh, it's not such an unambiguous term as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, let's guys. make this last question. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Just to remind you that uh, we are a little bit, uh, yeah, I don't want to like cut the discussion uh, in the middle because it's very good, but uh, we are also a little bit over the time, so and we have another yes. seminar starting in about twenty minutes. So if you could all uh, wrap it up, it would be nice. Okay, thank you yes, very much. Yes, I want to wrap it up with Carl's question. Is that okay? Yes, sure, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, no, I, I wrote this in chat, but I, I kind of want to make two points, and I think Eric, uh, the first is to sort of reiterate Eric's point, I think at least. And and sort of urge us since I take this seminar to be a lot about sort of philosophical methodology in a way in terms of thinking about the planetary and really thinking hard I think about what is the proper space for for philosophy as an activity and and, and its relationship to to the to the planet uh, in, in in that in that sense because, because this is very interesting as if nothing else as a survey of the ways in which the the planet has been approached by philosophy. Uh, what, what I was going to ask in this sort of it also builds on Sebastian's question in the sense that we have been talking about figures and I sort of I wonder if you can say something return to the concept of a figure uh, briefly again and say something more about that and also perhaps uh, say something about how a figure how different figures relate to a, a ground is, is there is there a shared ground between the figures because it, it's a it's a it's an interesting uh, uh, coupling to go with if we talk about figures what is what then is is their ground and can the grounds be compared to Right. Uh, first, in relation to that uh, part of the, the clarificatory part of the question where you reiterated Eric's point, I think basically what I wanted to come, the, the moment I wanted to, wanted, to, wanted to conclude with is basically this claim 
that this is the space for philosophical methodology. When we really think positively about metaphors as engines of ontogenesis, as engines of conceptual, that some kind of conceptual assembly lines that metaphors are. And I think that best philosophical methodologies are actually the way how to make use of metaphors as you know, providing some kind of cognitive insight. So that was where I wanted to lead all this session to this one particular point. Uh, so maybe that's also the way how we can uh, answer the second part of your question, Carl. What is the relation between the figure and the ground? I think that in the end, what the way, the way how use the term figure really tries to uh, exploit all the connotations. That means on the one hand, yes, figure is something that is related to the ground, but also figure we can think about it more in a sense of the way how the very act of figuring something, of diagramming, for example, something is a foundational act of uh, organizing space and suggestion how the space should be organized. So actually in this sense, the, the ground, the background comes up, up after the figure. The figure precedes the ground, right? And it generates the ground, meaning it generates also the topology that that figure is related to. That's the moment where I wanted to go to Shuttle. Yeah, Carol. Thank you. And that's it. Yeah. That's it. Thank you so much for all the questions and for this really intense debate. I, I'm sorry I, I couldn't keep up with time. Next time I'm going to have a better, uh, a better timing. So uh, really, this is we we are ending in the middle of uh, of actually finding out a way how to think about planetary in some positive topological terms. We still haven't arrived there. So let's do it at the beginning of the next session next Saturday. I'll be looking forward to see all of you there. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.